don't know. Okay, so let's go ahead and start here. All right, so there is a lot to go over in this chapter, and then a lot of this stuff that like is in these slides, you know, stuff you're going to be going over your book. So I'm going to try to just do like an overview of each of them because I don't want to just copy exactly what's in your book and everything. Okay. Um, and then, so the other, the second part of the lesson will be posted on Thursday. Um, but it will be a recorded session if you won't have like a live lecture like we do right now because I will be, I have, I have to do something so I won't be working that day. But um, so this part will go over like the musculoskeletal system, uh, the anatomy and, you know, diseases and disorders. And then the one on Thursday will go over treatments. So, you know, like the hot and cold therapy, casting and splinting, um, diagnostic imaging, how to differentiate the types of fractures and stuff. So, um, so I'm going to put like lots of videos and stuff too. Uh, for you guys to look at and then post a few questions. So um, and we're going to be creating a Jeopardy game. So what I kind of plan to do is on Friday when I'm back uh, during my normal like office hours, instead I'm going to do a study session and we'll play a Jeopardy game together. Cool. So, but I think you've taken this test already, right? Um. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, uh, so we're going to go over this. So anatomy of the musculoskeletal system, you know, it's responsible for our body movement, protection and framework, or, or really support for, you know, your body and then the organs, and storage for important minerals such as calcium. So that's what uh, why you need calcium is to help your bones, because that's where it stores it. So, um, and then it helps to also continuously form new blood cells, by process of hematopoiesis. Not say that word correctly, sorry. Okay, uh, so the human body has more than 200 bones. 80 of those bones are in the axial skeleton, which is the skull, the rib cage, spinal or vertebrae column, and hyo hyo hyoid, sorry, <laughs> bone. And then your appendicular skeleton is 106 bones, um, which is your scapula, humerus, your pelvic, uh, femoral, tibia, fibula, ankles, feet. Um, and it's amazing how many bones are in your hands and feet alone. Those have much smaller, you know, bones than the most of your body. So the tiniest bones are going to be in those areas, your hands and feet. So, okay. Um, so, yeah, the different types of bones. Uh, so, basically, um, you know, I know this goes over in your book and everything anyways. Um, so, actually, do you want me to go over this one, or does this pretty much make sense? Um, like the different types of bones. What's that? You can do either. Okay. I can do you. I'm good. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of um, to go over like which which ones are like the spongy or, or less dense um, than like a compact bone, which a compact bone is just made up of more structural units. Uh, there, there's more. I think I, I want to get to the one about osteoporosis to kind of explain that a little bit better. But there's more components basically uh, in it. So, all right. And then now we have joints. So, the different types of joints that you have are the ones that are immovable or synarthrosis. Oh my gosh, sorry, synarthrosis. So, those are the immobile uh, types of joints. And then we have one that is uh, limited range of motion. So you still get a range of motion, but like not, not a full range. So you can only move certain ways. And then you have like the full range of motion, which will be like the synovial joints. Um, so like your knee and your shoulders, um, 
those have more range of motion. So, okay. Um, go over. Oops. Okay. Yeah. So this is what I also wanted to go over because I, you know, again, I don't want to just like read exactly like what's out of your guys's book or anything. Um, so, but I wanted to go over like some symptoms of musculoskeletal problems. Um, so, I mean, the most common symptoms you're going to have is inflammation, swelling, um, or pain in the, you know, the joints or whatever affected area. Um, so some questions you want to ask, like if a patient comes in and they're say like their knee hurts per se, you want to ask them if there is any swelling, because that could mean that they have uh, gout or they might just have uh, some fluid in there uh, needs to be drained. Um, and ask them like the pain level uh, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst pain, you know, like how bad the pain is. Does the pain get worse? doing something particular and does it get better? You know, what What makes the pain worse and what makes it better, basically? Right. Um, that'll um, help the doctor determine, you know, too, like what the issue is. So. I was wondering if you could just go over what gout was, I forgot. What, what was? Gout. Gout, yeah. yes. So let me show you a, that would toe and stuff. So this is uh, the most common area where someone will get gout is right in like their toes or their fingers. Those uh, toes and fingers, yeah, those are the most common areas basically. Um, but gout is pretty much like crystals that form in between a joint. So um, they look kind of like this. So there's, there's these crystals that form, um, and then we usually check their uric acid level because a high uric acid level will tell us, you know, because that's what it's made out of, yeah. is crystals made from a uric acid. Um, so basically it kind of, because it like crystallizes and everything, you have limited range of motion. Um, so you're not gonna be able to really move that joint very well. And then it causes a lot of pain and swelling too. So, because it's not supposed to be that type of like crystallized fluid in there. Mm -hmm. So, so is it um, caused by like arthritis or is there? Yeah, so there's gouty arthritis too. Um, so, let's see. And I'm trying to find a picture or something that would describe that. Um, because someone who has arthritis is more apt to get uh, gout. So let's see. Yes. Look to see if it'll show on an x ray or something. Oh my goodness. Um, that's still just mostly like the gout stuff. <laughs> I wish we had a better picture of this. But the thing with like arthritis though is it doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna have that buildup uh, of the uric acid crystals. Um, you can have arthritis and not have any swelling or anything in your, uh, wherever it's affected. But usually like if you have um, gout, wherever the issue is, you're going to have lots of pain and swelling. Um, so something sort of like that. So that doesn't necessarily happen though with arthritis. Um, um, the gout is more painful than arthritis is. So I've seen like a lot of um, people with the little bump on their like um, big toe. Uh-huh. I don't think it was gout. Is it like something else that looks like it? I don't remember what it is. Oh, yeah. Um, like a bunion or something? A bunion. That's, yeah. So is a bunion a different thing? What's that last part? Is a bunion different from gout? Is it just like... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of... Let's see. 
it's it's definitely different from gut where basically it's kind of and this happens to a lot of people who they like those shoes that kind of are pointed and everything um yeah. because you're like basically bending your toes in a way that you're not supposed to be so that can be what causes it is like the you know you have the um oh my goodness gracious i don't know why i can <laughs> think um between the bones, your joint and everything, uh, basically will push out to the side and cause that. So, okay. and then it causes some inflammation too, because that's not supposed to happen, of course. So, okay. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do too, is like go over some like real x-rays of what certain um look like because some of it, like they're these you know are pretty obvious that there are some breaks here um but some of them are not as obvious so kind of want to show you guys too like how to read an x-ray um a lot of times what's really helpful too is for the provider you know if they have a patient that goes down to get an x-ray um we're basically waiting on those results so we can decide what type of splint or cast we need to place. Um, you'll be able to see the image before you actually get the results because basically like they go down, they get the image done, and then that image gets sent off to a, a radiologist who reads it and then tells you what they see on there. Um, but sometimes it's like much faster for us to look on there because sometimes there are more obvious ones and then uh, but yeah, I'll show you some x-rays that are not as obvious that are pretty cool. But yeah, these ones are pretty obvious. So um, I wish this little thing would get out of the way. Yeah. Um, so this is a non-displaced fracture. So you can see that there is a break in the bone, but it's still where it's supposed to be. Um, where this one would be a trans transverse or displaced one. So it it's clearly like completely broken, but then also shifted from where it's supposed to be. Um, and then, so this one that has, I mean, obviously this one, this compound fracture, like that's going to be pretty obvious. So, which you will likely not see. Um, this is something someone definitely would go to the emergency room for and would need to get uh, ortho ASAP. So, um, oh, Caitlin, so sorry. Um, so I was wondering, have you ever had like somebody come in complaining of like pain or something, but they didn't realize that their bone was broken? Uh huh? Really? Oh like, yeah. Are you? It's so weird. Yeah, that actually. Um, I want to say it happens like a ton, but yeah, uh, that does happen. Um, where someone they. They usually come in like several days or weeks later because it's not getting better. And then they find out that they actually had a break. Um, Cause most of the time, like a lot of people, you know, if they do injure themselves or whatever, and you have like the pain there, you're like, oh, I probably sprained it. Or, you know, I can't really move it because it hurts too much. And so it probably is just, you know, some inflammation or whatever. Um, but yeah, usually like after a week or so, the patient's kind of like, um, it's not getting any better and I still can't move it. So then they'll come in and we'll get an x-ray done. But yeah, that does happen. Um, if they go like a week or longer, doesn't it start to heal wrong? Yeah. Oh, geez. Do you have to like break it again and then fix it? Not necessarily. I mean, like I really, um, that would be a pretty rare case. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I mean, they take a long time to heal anyways. So usually at that point we can still get them in a splint or a cast. Um, Cause they'll start to have little calcium deposits, which I'll, I'll also show you what that looks like on an x-ray cause it's pretty cool. Um, cause what we'll do too is usually like a week or two after they get the x-ray done that shows the break, uh, we'll do another x-ray. And then you can see the calcium deposits to make sure that it's forming correctly. So, you know, it's not going off to the side or 
healing, you know, how it healing properly, basically. So yeah. Um, there was other things. Oh yeah. So the osteoporosis. So this is what I was kind of wanted to go over, like with the bone density. So like, because you have the different kinds of bones. Um, so a normal bone will have, you know, some pores and everything because that, of course, you have blood cells and everything that form there and also absorbs calcium. Uh, so you need to have some pores so it can absorb and then also, you know, transfer the blood cells to the rest of your body. But uh, osteoporosis, you start to have more of these holes. So your bone is not as dense and more likely to break a bone. It's, it's more fragile now. So, um, Usually after menopause, this is what commonly happens to females is they'll start to get osteoporosis, which is, or yeah, osteoporosis. Um, and then on occasion, like severe osteoporosis, that usually is, you know, as you get older and everything, but a really good way to like build, because you can actually reverse the effects of osteoporosis um, with either with medications or hormone therapy, um, or they'll they'll recommend, which is this is the most common one that they'll recommend first, is having them do calcium and vitamin D, taking the taking both of those, so taking the vitamin D actually helps them to absorb the calcium more. And then weight bearing exercises, um, like walking is a good one. So it'll help to, you know, help with the uh the density and everything. So it won't be as brittle, but yeah, that's definitely, you know, if someone was to fall and they had osteoporosis, they're just way more likely to have a break. So. Uh -huh. What's that? There are a lot of people who go through it. Your thing's kind of breaking up. Can you kind of keep a little chat box? Sorry. Yeah, they do, which is why, like, they usually get a bone density scan, which is called a DEXA scan, uh, once a year to check to make sure, you know, like their bone density is still normal or if it's getting worse or anything. So, um, they, you know, usually like mm -hmm. men, they only do the bone density scan. Um, like once a year, or no, I'm sorry, not once a year. For females, they usually do it once a year. Uh, for males, it's like every five years because they're less likely to get osteoporosis. Well, hopefully she will join us back here. Um, so I wanted to go over, because again, I'm gonna post this in your guys' course for you guys to review. I just don't wanna read it directly, you know, basically what's already in your book and just be a broken record here. But um, so I am going to go over some x-ray images to show you what different breaks look like and uh, how to identify them. So let's see, uh, fractures on x-ray. Okay, so uh, real quick, what I was showing earlier. Um, so in your hand, you can see like how many little bones you have uh, in. Oh, let me Say, can you hear better now? Yeah, sorry. I think the weather is screwing up the internet or something. No, that's okay. I mean, a lot of people are online, so it makes it more difficult and stuff. So, 
Um, but I was just gonna go over like some x-rays and then what I was first going over like in your hand and everything because you have so many joints there or not, you do have several joints, but I mean also bones okay. and stuff. Um, so you can kind of see all of these different types of bones uh, that then we, oh, I was trying to scroll up like with the programming used to use. Um, but basically how, this is why you have such a good range of motion is because you have so many different kinds of bones and then joints that move in different ways. So um, like your knee and your other joints don't have as many of these bones uh, like your hands and everything we do. So because otherwise we wouldn't be able to individually move each one of our fingers or completely twist our wrist around. So yeah. Um, so on an x-ray, some of these are pretty obvious ones, but um, Okay, so here, usually on an x-ray, what you'll see is it looks like a dark spot. So if you see, it's like a, a line kind of like this. Um, so this would be a type of fracture. So this is not something that's like displaced, um, but it is still fractured. And we wanna make sure that we do split them so that way they don't have that bone displaced. But sometimes you kind of see like a small line over here, um, and but that's not, Sometimes that can just be like some markings on the bone. And that's where it gets hard to sometimes differentiate between, you know, if it's a fracture or if it's just uh, scarring on the bone. So um, this one is pretty crazy. So, uh, so this one obviously is a displaced and also a compound fracture. Um, and that's going to need surgery for sure. Let's see. Let's see. Hold on. Let me actually like, um, let's get the end. Because this is the area that a lot of people have a hard time seeing is fractures on the hand. Um, some of them can be kind of obvious, but a lot of times because you have so many different spaces and everything. Um, so like this one, it was pretty easy to see. You can see like that's definitely a break. Mm -hmm. So you just have that darker line through there. So your bones are gonna show up lighter. Um, and I'll show you in a minute here, like what the calcium deposits look like. But yeah, on the next one, you can see that that one is clearly a break. And let's try to find a different one that's not as obvious. I don't know if this one shows. I'm wondering if they just showed the. Um, yeah. And they'll they'll do different views of your hand, your foot, your leg. You know, whatever it is that they are uh, doing. So that way, because sometimes one angle you wouldn't see a break and another one you will, or sometimes it looks like it's a break, but then it's not. So, um, but right here yeah. is where I see that. Okay, ooh, boxer fracture. <laughs> these, <laughs> these suck. Um, so this one is basically displaced. So right here you can see like that should not be sitting on top of that bone. So um, they call this a boxer fracture because you can, when you hit so hard, it just causes uh, the, I don't know why my brain is not working today. They're not phalanges. I don't know why I want to call them that. But um, and it's not the talus. Why am I thinking that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> Oh, your metatarsals. Duh. Okay, sorry. I was I kept thinking of other words where I was like, you know, your phalanges and anyways, so um but right in here, like your metatarsals is where they'll usually get like a broken bone. It's usually either uh their the one that's connected to their uh 
last digit or their first one. So their thumb or their finger basically. So um, so wrist fractures are way harder to see because you have so many different little bones in your wrist already. So it's hard to you know differentiate between like is the dark space just the space between the bones or is it a brain? Um, these ones I definitely have a hard time with figuring that out because you know again like to me that looks kind of normal because there's so many different little spaces between each one of those little tiny bones anyways. So um let's see. Trying to find a better one. Let's do a different one. So like so not of the hand, but let's try. Well, let's do a spiral fracture. Okay, so a spiral fracture is kind of just like a compound fracture. So it's where um, it's still connected, but but splintered off essentially. Um, it's not completely like it. It may not be completely broken, although it's still, um, but it's completely shattered essentially. So rather than having like you know like the clean like a clean break, uh, kind of like this is more of a clean break, although that's still. But um, but the pieces of bone are kind of scattered out more. Um, so that's a spiral fracture. But let's look at a different kind. Okay. So this is a common type of fracture we see too. Is um, a lot of times, like in the doctor's office, unless you work for an orthopedic doctor, then you'll see all sorts of ones. But most commonly, the ones that we see are either um, hands, feet, or uh, their arm. So uh, mostly, I'm trying to find one that's not like a crazy fracture. And that's what they'll do too is the radiologist will put a little arrow to show like where the fracture's at. Um, and reading x-rays and stuff is not something you guys have to learn. It's um, it's just sometimes helpful for you to like kind of know so you can tell the doctor like, hey, the x-rays, you know, look here or something. Um, and it's also kind of cool to like look at people's bones and stuff. But I will tell you, because I just saw this one where it's like, you know, a, a kid. Um, reading a kid's one is much harder because their bones are still developing. So to me, it all looks abnormal. Like it looks like a lot of their bones are broken, but it's normal because their bones are still developing. So yeah, reading an adult's x-ray rather than a kid's is, is much different. Um, yeah, so this one, uh, so this is one of the common injuries that people have uh, in their arm. And usually this type of splint, which I'm going to go over, I'll do a recorded lecture on, on that to show you guys the different kinds of casts and how to do them. Um, casting is really cool. It's really fun. That's like one of my favorite parts of uh, my job is splint, doing splints and stuff because there's so many different kinds. So, um, yeah, these are not the best examples of what I wanted to show you guys because a lot of these are like super obvious. Um, okay, but I'll show you what the calcium deposits look like. But essentially, like when you're looking at an X-ray, knowing you know what a normal bone looks like and then what the break looks like, so it'll always be like a darker line. Um, but sometimes they're not that obvious, so you might have to like zoom in a little bit. Um, but yeah, like this one, obviously it's like, oh yeah, duh, that's broken. So, <laughs> but that most of the time you're not gonna have like these obvious ones because these usually occur from like, you know, a pretty bad accident. So, but usually like if someone just like fell off their bike, um, you know, injured themselves, it's not gonna be crazy like that. 
Um, okay, so let's look at calcium deposit on an x-ray. Because that usually shows us that the bone is healing. Calcium deposits, okay, in a fracture on oh, x-ray. That might be a little bit better. Okay, well, on this one here, um, it's hard to tell like where the break was, but you can kind of see like it is, it kind of shows up a little bit wider. Uh, the calcium deposits do. I want to find like a much better picture for you guys. Well, anyways, when you are looking at an x-ray, the area that's darker Can you hear me, Tegila? Can you hear me okay, Tegila? I can hear you now, Kayla. Okay, gotcha. Um, so I was trying to look for ones that are more obvious that it's, uh, you know, when you have a bone that is healing, um, but the, the calcium deposit, so when you're looking at an x-ray, you can see like the bone, where the bone is like the most dense is where it actually is lighter. And then where it's less dense is where you have like the darker spots. But usually when you have a fracture and then those calcium deposits start to form, they're brighter than um, or lighter than these other areas. Um, so this one's kind of hard to see, but like just this little tiny spot here is a little bit lighter than the other parts of the bone. Um, so those are some calcium deposits, but I want to find one that's like really obvious. Because um, what we'll usually, you know, do is they'll come in, you know, initially, and then they'll get the x-ray done, and then we hook them up with a splint or a cast or whatever. And then, you know, a few weeks or a month later, then we'll check to see if the bone is healing properly. Um, but this one's might be a little bit better. So like here, we can see there was once a break and then there's new calcium deposits. So they just show up a lot brighter uh, than the normal, the, the other areas of the bone. I just wanted to find one that was like really obvious and cool. So, um, darn it. But yeah, anyways, so what's really nice now about the programs they have these days is it used to be you being in a dark room where you have to, uh, so you basically like the old fashioned way that we did it was, and you still go into a room where you have like the lead drapes and everything to protect yourself. Um, and you still kind of, you know, go up against a wall or whatever, but the, the film, Canister uh, doesn't actually have film in it. It just transfers the, it collects the image still, but it just transfers it to a computer. So you're not actually like processing an actual film. Um, so that's kind of like when I first got out of school, I also got my X-ray te uh, tech license. So I could do those, um, but yeah, they're pretty complicated because depending on the density of the bone, you have to change the amount of 
exposure because you know, otherwise it could show up like way bright and you really can't see anything or it could show too dark and then again you also can't see anything so it just kind of depended on the phone that you're doing and the density and the different angles that you wanted to get because again you know like you can look at it one way and don't see anything and then it turns to a different view and you're like oh yeah that's obvious that way so um but yeah it used to be like you do you have like a film in a cartridge that you then take into the dark room then um i thought it was kind of fun though because you actually are kind of blindly doing it and so it's all by memory of where stuff is um but you have to like take the film out and put it in the processor, but then you have to like look for the film, like a new film to put in the canister. You have to do it all the right way and everything. Um, but you have to make sure that it stays dark because otherwise once you expose the film to it, then it's ruined. So, um, but it used to be pretty fun to do those, to do the x-rays and everything. Um, most offices now, like if they have a uh, x-ray, they'll usually have you know, a, a radiologist who's actually doing them, uh, which is why, I mean, because I used to work in a doctor's office that we had an x-ray machine and really it was kind of like up to us if a doctor wanted an x-ray to go and do it. Uh, so that's why I got my x-ray tech license. And, but now it's just pretty much like most clinics, they have like a whole department that does that. So uh, yeah, but, they're pretty cool to read and look at and see what's going on. Um, and same like with MRIs and stuff, like MRIs, really cool. Cause an MRI is basically like, as if you were doing sections. Um, so let's look at an MRI for, for example. So I wish you could kind of like, I don't know if I can scroll through this. I wanna see if I can find it a GIF or a GIF. How are you seeing that? I've seen these in like doctor shows. I don't know if they're realistic, but they're really cool looking. Yeah, it's like really like an MRI is almost like you slice something into little sections in a few different ways. So uh, laterally and vertically is kind of like what it looks like. So you can go through and um, this is Oh, that one actually moves. Hold on. <laughs> I want to find like a really good one. This reminds me of, I think that's probably off of like a TV show or something. Um, <laughs> let's do an MRI of shit. But yeah, it's like it breaks it off into little sections. So uh, different little like planes. Um, and again, like vertically and laterally, um, they're really cool to look at too. So uh, to me, I have no idea how to read MRIs. Um, that's why they have radiologists who do all that kind of stuff. I just know mostly x-rays. Um, but yeah, it's really cool to see how this works. Um, Actually, if I could, I don't know if I can pause it. Um, I want to show you something. Hold on. are just much more accurate too because you're doing it by like little tiny sections um but we want to see okay so yeah like what a, what a lot of people don't realize is like how big the sinus cavity is um because they usually just think of it as like just their nose and whatnot but here's where you can kind of see like in their nose that leads to their throat so it it's all connected to your throat here, but you do have in the frontal lobe like a space that is also where the sinus cavity uh, is that can get pretty, you know, 
you don't duck when you have a cold. So that's why like a lot of people feel pressure like above their nose, like they have like a um, headache that's specifically just like in one area in the front. So yeah, like the sinus cavity is actually pretty big. Um, and don't ever worry about like when you because sometimes i think what before people were worried about when we do certain testing is when you do a nasopharyngeal and geo swab people are like afraid that they're gonna like um go at the wrong angle and then like go into the brain or something <laughs> which you're not going to do. So <laughs> it's pretty much like when you get it in there, it'll pretty much go downward because that's the way the anatomy is kind of like facing it. It's kind of hard to get up into that upper cavity. You have to have like a special camera and stuff to go up there. So, um, so don't worry about thinking you're going to you know, damage something. <laughs> I think that was something that a few people thought before. I don't really know why. Um, no. <laughs> Yeah, you're not gonna accidentally, you know, go the wrong direction or anything. But I know, I feel really funny in that picture. So, so yeah, so what you're supposed to do because a lot of people they'll go instead of going at this angle, which is what you want, you have to um there is you know space in there. So but people sometimes go like straight up. Which then, you know, you're you're still not going to get into that upper cavity because actually, like, if you can kind of see here, I mean, it is kind of blocked off. So you're not going to, you know, go right into that cavity there. But yeah, so you just have to go at a uh, at this angle rather than straight up their nose. So and then that's what it does is it gets to the back of their throat where all of their, you know, because if we did just the throat, like your sinuses and everything drain into your throat, but you might not get the best sample. So but that's what it looks like basically on the inside. So it does go pretty far in. Um, yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is create a Jeopardy for us all to look at, but um, I just don't want to read exactly what was off your guys' book and just repeat the same information. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do, you know, again, Thursday, it'll be a recorded lecture. Um, so it will be posted uh, Thursday morning, basically, and at the end of this module. Uh, but we'll go over different kinds of splits that you put on people and how you determine which the doctor really is going to be the one determining the type of split that they get on them, but um, just kind of going over a few of the different kinds of splits. Uh, and so that way you guys are kind of familiar too, because when you get out there and a doctor comes out and they say, I need to do a reverse uh, trigger tongue splint, you're going to have no idea what they're talking about. So, <laughs> um, and then it also explains too, because it's like it, it might look similar certain splints, um, but it limits, you know, range of motion sometimes. So, because the goal is to like, you still want them to have as much range of motion as they can without moving the bone that's broken. So, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, that's pretty much it for today. Do you have any questions? Um, nope. Okie dokie. Thank you, Kaylin. No problem. Have a good time. Talk to you later. You too. Bye. Bye.